Um, so today I'm going to talk about something that's uh, pretty near and dear to my heart, which is, uh, I'm calling it audio innovation. Uh, so basically, I'm just talking about procedural audio, you could say, or generative audio. Uh, but it just boils down to doing cool stuff with, is it working? It's good. Uh, just basically doing cool stuff, new stuff with audio. Uh, basically, I want to kind of answer the question of like, why isn't there not as much happening in the sphere of like audio and like cool technology and stuff like that? Uh, you see it popping up a lot, uh, but you don't see like the same level of just the like, consistent innovation that you see with graphics. So, also want to point out that I'm not like advocating at all that generative audio, procedural audio is somehow better than anything that's like handcrafted because like there's always a place and time for everything. Um, so I want to know who, who's been in the industry for, who's, who's a student and who's been working uh, in the industry? Everyone, student, raise your hands. How about that? Okay. Okay. Who's in the industry then too? Are right, you guys working audio? Well, yeah. Okay. So, who's optimistic about the future of generative audio or procedural audio? Yeah. Okay. Who's pessimistic about it, you'd say? Or middle into pessimistic? I'm scared. Okay, cool. This is like exactly what my theory is, which is like, I, I'm, I wonder if this is the next slide. Yeah, sure. Faith that generative audio is really going to be a thing. Plotted against years in the games industry. Start off. Zero years in the game industry, you've got complete faith. Give it a few years, reality sets in. So, um, so I mean, you just notice with like cynical, grizzled vets that um, people just get very cynical about the state of doing anything more complicated than playing back a sound. Uh, and it really shouldn't be that way. Uh, so, I'll set the scene for when I graduated. I graduated from Berklee College of Music, uh, and then I started researching like uh, music technology at Georgia Tech. And when I emerged into the real world, I was ready to like do some amazing stuff with audio and games. Um, so I mean, I was, oh, here we go. Yeah. That's the grizzled vet and the fresh-faced, uh, I guess, me coming out of college. So I saw things like in Spore, they had like integrated pure data. In Portal, there was like generative audio uh, music system, uh, played the music depending on what you were doing and context. Dead Space had their fear emitter system, which was really cool and very simple, but just like very effective use of generative audio. And then even like Super Mario Galaxy did some really cool stuff, which it syncs the sound effects of jumping to the time of the music. It just makes you feel really fluid, it makes everything like just work really well. But like I said, there's lots of cool things that happen in these little bursts, but they're not happening. None of these things get reused. Like none of these become normal techniques and standardized. So started working at CCP, uh, and I was using the latest middleware Wise at that time. It was uh, still relatively new for the for AAA, and um, reality kind of set in. And there's nothing really against wise at all. Like, um, yeah, I mean, it's ugly. But uh, I mean, wise is it's great in so many ways. But first of all, I mean, it hasn't changed since I first started using it in any substantial way. Uh, and it's really just a glorified jukebox at the end of the day that has, it has some good like routing to stuff and the profiling can be really useful. But I kind of had this view of that audio is stuck in the sprite era, right? I mean, in sprites, yeah, I'll just go to the next one. Sprites, you have uh, just, you have a single image. You, you uh, draw every single frame of the animation. Uh, there's no way to kind of, it's not like a model where you can just smoothly animate it. Like someone has to redraw every single frame of animation uh, and in that way, that's kind of like what audio is, because audio is just like, like the sprite is just a picture, uh, a audio file just plays back 
Uh, maybe you put a low pass filter based on the distance, but that's just like changing the color of the sprite or something like that. It's not anything super advanced. And um, that's basically the state of the state of audio is I see generative audio as something that is that switch between sprites to 3D graphics. Because right now, I mean, everything is basically handcrafted. That's our only real option. Um, you could do something like Spore and, and integrate pure data and have a generative audio system, but that took two and a half engineers over a year to do. Um, and there's other examples like in one of the Call of Duty games, I believe it is, like all the guns are a single impulse of a bullet leaving the uh, muzzle, and each so sound, uh, sound of each gun is depends on the filters uh, based on the length of the barrel and stuff like that. So each gun has a unique sound, even though the source is only like the bullet leaving the same the same source for every single gun. That's a cool system. Didn't get reused. Uh, so. I'll explain this in a second. So the more I thought about this parallel between the sprites and graphics uh, and audio, the more I noticed that there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels. So before uh, in the you know in the early mid '90s and before, every single game basically had its own rendering engine. People would rewrite the entire game engine from scratch for a lot of games. Maybe you could get a couple sequels out of it. Maybe uh, you know if you had the the money to really invest in making stuff that was reusable by other people, then you could like package it and sell it as a game engine. But basically, the entire pipeline graphics, audio, gameplay uh, was done on a case by case basis, uh, and that's kind of what audio is like still today. So if you write an audio system that's anything more complicated than just playing back a single sound or filtering it based on distance, you have to reinvent the wheel every single time. Like one common example that I use is there's the rule of three uh, technique, which is like if there's more than three sounds playing in a certain area, you can't distinguish between three or any more. You just hear a lot of shit happening in that area. So you switch over, you can switch over to a kind of more chaotic sound in that area, you know, and so you have to figure out you have to use the type of game objects that that game is using, group them together, figure out where the source is, convert to the other sound, and it's different for every single game uh, because there's this really tight coupling between the audio system and uh, and the game the game itself, which used to always happen for graphics. Um, so it's really easy to see why that happens. Because game development is just really, really difficult. Uh, deadlines are always blown past. Things that have, features change, features get added, content comes in slowly, and then it comes in really fast in the last couple months. You know, it's just pure chaos, and uh, you never really have a full. Okay, this is the beginning of the project. In the beginning of the project, you architecture everything to be reusable. You architecture everything to be like beautifully designed, and then when the rubber hits the road, it's just a fight to survive. Um, I don't know why I always think of Black Friday as uh, chaos whenever I want to picture pure chaos, but um, this is just the reality of it. You know, everything just goes out the window. All of the beautiful design plans that you have. Um, so the life cycle of a good architecture task and game development goes from a must-have to a should have, to a could have, uh, then it gets to purgatory, deferred. People don't usually like to say they won't do it because everyone wants to hang on to that glimmer of hope that maybe we'll do things the right way next time, but it never happens. It just, deferred is just a uh, place where tasks are gonna die. Um, so, so inevitably, when you try and make something that's reusable, and you like, for example, the rule of three system, you want to add some abstraction. You don't end up with enough time that you're chasing bugs, you're chasing new features, you're chasing content that's coming in in, in regular ways, uh, communication issues, and so you end up um, just really doing what needs to be done for the game at that time. To make something that's reusable has to have 
pretty concerted effort beforehand, and it's really just uh, not. I don't believe it's possible at game development studios just because their agenda is to put out a game. Um, I mean, there, there's a reason why you know Epic is pretty clearly delimited down. In, well, people get shifted over all the time between Fortnite and Unreal Engine, but um, supposedly Epic is pretty delimited down the center for game engine and uh, game development. You know, it's meant to be two completely separate things. Not always in practice, but whatever. Uh, but Unity is, they don't make games. They're just a game engine company. Like, there's two different roles. Making stuff that's reusable is like one type of company. Making games is a different type of company. So, well, I'll step back for a second. Um, so back to the question, why is it that graphics have had this big, long, explosion of innovation and audio hasn't, you know, and why, how did they escape from it? And so, uh, first thing that happened is GPUs. So, um, GPUs aren't the whole, aren't the whole reason why it happened, but GPUs were part of the uh, thing. Part of it also was magazines were really popular this time and you could, uh, and you sold magazines by sexy images. And so when you had all these sexy images of, the latest generation stuff. I don't think the left one is an example of that. Unreal is. <laughs> um, I just like that picture. Um, <laughs> that's your own thing, then. <laughs> so, so like, GPUs. I think if if would have been a fad if it wasn't for the fact that magazines were, um, you know, able to promote them basically. So, consumer demand made it so that games companies had a financial incentive to do it. I mean, consumers bought these graphics cards and they wanted games to play on them. So now uh, graphics, I mean, uh, video game development companies, now they had to do something different because they couldn't just keep doing the same kind of like direct rendering engine that they've always been doing. Now they had to support multiple types of GPUs, each with their own, I know there's probably like two or three different languages in the early days, maybe just two and then Open GLK later, but um, they had to support multiple types of uh, GPUs and also just like the regular old rendering because some people didn't have graphics cards yet, and so that led to some uh, unintended consequences that were very positive for graphics. So, first thing is that uh, they had to abstract out. Uh, so basically, for people who aren't engineers, and that when you abstract uh, a layer, you're you're not dealing directly with the underlying stuff. You're kind of creating a layer that uh, you can kind of swap out implementations underneath. So instead of just writing a graphics rendering engine that's going to render directly to the screen or directly to one specific card, you have the game talk to this abstraction layer, which in turn talks to the specific card that's installed on a user's machine. <coughs> Uh, and what is beneficial, I mean, this is the way that things should be done. Uh, it's not always the, the most efficient way to do things. Uh, and so it only happened when their hand was forced by the consumer demand. So uh, when you have that layer of abstraction, you're also decoupling things from each other and you make it easier to reuse it. So now, like, now that you have a shader language uh, and you have this kind of like generic interface to the graphics engine, you can start uh, reusing stuff without depending on the game system, the game engine itself. You know, you start treating the graphics and the game as two separate things rather than this spaghetti that it had been before. And so that allowed reuse. Um, that also uh, helped with outsourcing because now if you have a fixed pipeline, which is what the GPU's method was called back in the early days, uh, the way that they did their computations kind of led to a uh, fixed pipeline in the asset pipeline as well, too, because now, like, you can make uh, shaders and 3D models and run them without running the game. So it might not sound like a big thing, but if you've worked in sound, we still work with the game all the time. There's very few companies that, have, that are good at what they do 
well, there's probably no companies that are good at what they do for audio that are just a pure asset factory, like pumping out WAV files. You know, like the, this is, I've seen this attempted so many times and tried to attempt, you know, been the driver of trying to attempt it on, on more than one occasion. Uh, and now I just realize how bad of an idea it is that there's this idea that you can be like a car factory making parts for a car. Like you get a request in uh, and that is for like a specific sound. You make that sound and then you give it to them and then you wash your hands. You know, like uh, that's the kind of dream, but it never ends up happening that way because audio ends up so tightly coupled with the game engine that you have to be in your game. You have to be running builds. And then you have a bunch of content guys who aren't necessarily like super technical trying to uh, run Visual Studio and you lose, you know, days a week easily. You know, there's a problem with Perforce and, you know, but you don't have that issue with graphics as much because of the decoupling and the abstraction is now you can make a 3D model, you can preview it totally outside of the game system. You can go front to end animation, uh, uh, texturing, shaders, uh, the 3D model itself, the animation rigging, uh, probably repeating myself, but um, that happens all separate from the game. So it's just easier to outsource, you know, that drives the cost down, makes it easier to produce assets and stuff. Uh, and then C, which I think it's probably, uh, I think not been appreciated enough. Um, it also allowed people to transfer their knowledge better. You know, like there's always a bit of that. So what I mean by that is like, if I'm like working at Blizzard and I'm working on graphics, before there is that layer of abstraction where everyone is kind of like targeting the same couple of graphics cards with the same kind of fixed pipeline. Um, if I, you know, leave Blizzard and start working for id software instead, then I can't bring over that knowledge as well because they have a whole different rendering engine underneath the hood. You know, even game to game, as I mentioned before, it has a totally different rendering engine under the hood. So you, you, there's a lot of starting from scratch every single time. Again, that's something that happens uh, quite often in audio as well too. Uh, but after the GPUs and after the uh, common language that people use, the common like shader languages. Uh, now, like if I leave Blizzard and go to it, I have, I can bring a lot of information with me. You know, I can, I know how it works. There's a lot less time to spin me up. And, you know, I've seen that in practice many times, like, you know, bringing on some rendering guru and they don't need a week to get going. They just like, you know, they get stuff going like right away just because it's all kind of the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, simplifying a little bit. So, what's next? Yeah, so like I said, GPUs, they're only part of the problem. Uh, I'd say that uh, I'm, I'm kind of gonna build this metaphor of uh, how do you start a forest fire? Um, I know it's, not the, it's the, not the most pleasant metaphor to use, but think of fire as passion and not as like destroying shit. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I'd say, so in, in this kind of like, you know, we'll see how far the metaphor actually works, but uh, I'm trying it out on you guys. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the financial incentive, the customer demands, um, you know, the, the, the viewpoint of the game development companies who are kind of, you know, I'm talking about like management level who are thinking about it in terms of like efficiency, uh, you know, and turnaround stuff like that. I'd say that's, that's the match. Uh, and I'm calling this the kindling. So um, if you're not familiar with what these are, these are demos. Is, who knows demos? Who knows the demo scene? Okay. But you know of it? The, okay. So basically demos arise, arose out of, uh, I'll continue to a short history. It came out of piracy. Um, so like if someone pirated a, some software, uh, it was very competitive. And so they all wanted to kind of leave their mark. It's kind of like graffiti tagging. They would have this little um, demo at the beginning, which was just graphics and sounds, uh, super small files, as like small as you could do, uh, and just just like whoever made the coolest graphics and like sound stuff. Uh, and it was like so competitive that it ended up being huge competition. So you can see this one here. So yeah, one guy I worked with a lot was uh, a big member of the demo scene back in the day. He's one of the founders of Dice. So the Dice was founded by demo scene guys. 
So like they, there's a big kind of like intersection between video games and the, and the demo scene. Um, so part of the demo scene kind of ethos is like that hacker ethos of every information should be free, open. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people who are like when they discover some cool new technique that blows everyone away, they're not hiding that information. They're like telling everyone, they, once it's out in the wild, they've already got their credit. You know, they don't need to like prove themselves more than that. So they just tell everyone. And so you end up with all of these like random experiments, uh, you know, you know, one the, out of the current, uh, this ray tracing stuff that's happening lately, a lot of that comes out of what's been cool in the demo scene for like the last eight years, you know. Um, and so they're like way, they're, they're really way ahead of the curve on this. Um, I mean, they're making the curve, I would say. Um, them and SIGGRAPH. Uh, so like, so it's that attitude of like sharing information, um, you know. So started thinking about it. And um, yeah, and also SIGGRAPH is a good example too. So this kind of, this way of working, the way I see it is, there's a pretty low barrier of entry into this demo scene. You can make something in complete crap, put it out there. People aren't going to give you a bad time about it. I mean, it's pretty competitive, but like, you know, it's it's a lot of experimentation, and some of it works. Most of it doesn't work. You know, some of it maybe only has application for one particular type of graphics that looks a certain way and doesn't have a limited use. Out. It doesn't have much usage out of that. But like, enough people are doing this, and enough people are trying to one up each other in a friendly kind of way, in a friendly competitive kind of way, and sharing the information about how they did it, that like the techniques that are useful start bubbling up, right? They start getting used more often again in an organic way. Like there's no, there's no out, it's a, there's no like outside force that's kind of picking which ones are the best ones. It's just, they have all a very short-sighted view of things. They wanna make a really cool demo. Uh, and so they pick whatever techniques are gonna help them make that really cool demo. So, um, so it's got this low barrier of entry, uh, very open about information, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, and there's a lot of small experiments that are happening. And so, so innovation, I started realizing like real innovation, it's like not that idea that I think a lot of us has, which is like it's driven by genius, right? I mean, Edison's a great example because, I mean, people might be pissed I'm gonna put Tesla up there. But um, that's Edison, I think everyone can agree on, is a good example because he didn't invent any of this stuff. But he was—he kind of organized people and and took the credit, I think, most of the time. But um, he, it's not the work of people dictating what the new, unless you're John Carmack. Um, <laughs> he's the only one who can do it. Um, instead, it's what I call a collaborative iterative process. So I mean, SIGGRAPH is also got the same kind of ethos. And I think there's a lot of merging in between the demo scene and, and SIGGRAPH as well too. I mean, SIGGRAPH's been around for a very long time, uh, I think like 1969, um, but the flavor changed a lot when the demo scene kind of hit its apex. Uh, and I think the, a lot of the energy that you've seen over the last 20 years there is from uh, that kind of like hacker ethos uh, combining with more scientific view on things. Um, and you look at some, a lot of this SIGGRAPH stuff, and a lot of them are, a lot of the talks that they give there are dead ends as well too, but that doesn't matter, that's not the point. Doing something new is important, not necessarily doing something that's gonna be lasting or important, right? It's like, like I said, short-sighted in a way, but it's, it's the communal aspect of it. It's the um, collaboration. Uh, the good ideas bubble up and they become the foundation for the next things. Like, we only stand on the shoulders of giants, really, or, I guess not on the shoulders of giants. We stand on a pile of people, <laughs> a pile of dwarves. <laughs> so, um, so I'd say that's the that's the kindling, right? I mean, this is okay. This is the this this community is the is the forest, the forest burning down, right? This is the fire catching on all of them. So, in my kind of admittedly half-assed metaphor, you have three parts of it, right? The match, the kindling, and the uh, forest. So for graphics, we looked at that, right? I mean, the match was the customer demands. It's driven by magazines. Kindling were 
the shared shader language, GPUs, people communicate about it easily. Uh, and the fourth is just the sheer number of people involved in the community. Same thing kind of happened in iPhone. You know, iPhone, in early days of iPhone, it was a lot of really gimmicky, stupid ideas. I mean, not stupid, there were just, people were just going way too far with the new, new stuff. And that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was short-sighted and it doesn't matter because the good ideas that came out of that period bubbled up and got reused and you know, app development became more refined over the years. And so like all that continual process of experimentation is what leads to like lasting innovation because it always, it, it brings the foundation up higher and higher. Um, you know, yeah, I just threw that in there. So, you know, so anyway, oh, it goes right to the end. I think I uh, ran out of time to keep making slides. Let's see what my notes say here. So, um, Yeah, so how do we apply this to, to audio? So, um, I don't know, everyone, I think a lot of people have an idea that audio is somehow different than other things. Um, it's somehow a special case, and um, maybe they think not enough people enjoy audio to kind of drive the demand, or I don't know what it is, or maybe it's just, maybe it's just being in the back room for long enough, you start, uh, you've been down so long, it starts feeling like up. Um, I don't know, but I truly believe that this, what we've seen happen in graphics can happen in audio. Uh, I think that there are, based on my experience of talking with users of the games and like gauging with them, I feel like maybe four out of five, three or four out of five people are into the graphics, and then there are people, there's a, a significant group of people who care more about the audio than, the, especially now with the, you know, multiplayer games, uh, because audio gives you information that you can't see visually uh, in the 360 way. So if people really rely on like clean audio for uh, multiplayer games to kind of get it out of the battlefield awareness in the 360 way. So I think people uh, especially care during multiplayer games, but you know, people do care about audio. And um, so the, the match is the kind of customer demand, the kind of financial incentive um, or it could also just be making audio is super expensive, hard to outsource, let's make it more efficient, right? Um, so, but I think like you could build, I think there's a good opportunity right now to be building uh, customer demand by like doing stuff that would appeal to YouTube streamers. I mean, having, having kind of like, like I said, gimmicky isn't necessarily a bad thing. Have something that's kind of gimmicky that would like work really well on YouTube, at least for a short time. Uh, might get people more interested in, in audio systems and kind of, because people are always, streamers are always looking for the newest thing like to show off. Uh, people like to own what's a, something that they found that's funny or uh, different in some way. So, um, so I think like there's an opportunity both in YouTube streaming and stuff like that, which could be today's magazines essentially. And, um, but also I just think in just reducing efficiencies makes a pretty strong financial incentive. Uh, so the kindling would be the kind of like standardized language. It's kind of the, the threads that run through all of this stuff. Um, and well, I don't wanna make this about what I'm doing, but that's kind of what I'm doing. So come see my talk later and you can see what that's about. <laughs> right. um, but anyway, like part of, I mean, just, that is what I'm trying to do, but I think um, even if I fail at being the, the, the actual final kindling, like, you know, if I'm the beta max to the VHS, um, I think that starting this process, uh, if, it's, if it reaches a certain threshold, I think, comp, you know, it's, it's only gonna be good. Um, I think kicking off this process um, can be a really good thing. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so anyway, the, the, the fuel, the real source of the power is the community, obviously. So, um, I mean, really that's just down to, you can see it's pretty standardized across all of these ones. It's really just about getting people together, getting people communicating, having that ethos of sharing information, uh, having a community of people that are not about uh, withholding or hiding information, but about sharing. And, uh, and, and to be honest, like 
like I said, I've, I've known a few people who are in the demo scene back in the day, and uh, what always struck me is they were they talked just as excited about audio stuff as they did about the, the visual stuff. But the visual stuff is what uh, kind of went somewhere, uh, and and audio stagnated. But I don't think it's because people didn't think there were unique and challenging problems there. I think people, uh, you know, that's just the direction. Well, from what I talked about earlier in the talk, that's just. Um, a few coincidences that happened at the same time that led graphics to being uh, exploding more than audio did. But, but there's that same ethos for audio and, and uh, the demo scene and stuff like that from back in the day. So, um, so about the community, like we have um, in the 90s too, before GPUs, you, you had um, anyone who was like a 3D modeler or animator or rigger or stuff like that, they were probably thought themselves almost, uh, there's a, a few exceptions, but almost everybody thought of themselves as an artist first. They were probably trained at conservatory or they like, learned traditional art first. Uh, and then they kind of like learned technology because that was where some opportunity was or it seemed like a cool place to go. But the idea of like someone starting a career and like looking forward to, and like having the dream of having a full career as like a 3D modeler, a 3D animator, or just a digital artist in general, like it barely existed before GPUs. Uh, and so I think that right now, uh, that's what I was saying earlier in a talk where I think the idea of like handmade uh, sample by sample audio is still something that is relevant just as much as artists are still relevant in the digital age. Um, but I think that if there's a good platform, if, this, if there's this uh, right set of conditions, it could be a different type of role, which is like not someone who's uh, just creating pure content, but creating generative audio content. So um, I've been using the phrase um, lately, like a digital luthier, where luthier is like an instrument maker. So um, the digital luthier is someone who would be like, uh, a 3D animator or a tech artist or something like that. So, I mean, and obviously, you know, if this, the right conditions happen, it would have to be uh, people who are from the pure content side turning over. But I think, you know, if, if this actually happens, then it's like it would be a, a role that gets created and has like a specialist who that is all about. You know, you have someone who is doing the kind of like handcrafted audio stuff. You have someone who's who's like doing the variations or the generative stuff on that. So um, I guess that's just about it. Um, so I mean, my goal really was just to convince uh, everyone that audio is not inherently different than any other thing, that, that innovation can happen in audio, uh, and that it's really just a, uh, I mean, in, in, in retrospect, I think after something like this happens, it'll be obvious because I think it's like inevitable that it will happen. Maybe it'll be 50 years, but whatever. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to say it's like, you look back at graphics and you say like, well, of course graphics did that, you know? Of course they've had a 15 year streak of, of which is kind of slowing down by the way. But like, this, they're running out of kids. Um, but it's easy to do that in retrospect. There's just a, a couple things, stars aligned in a certain way to make it happen at that point. The fact that it hasn't happened at this particular point isn't necessarily any judgment on audio or any, any like, doesn't make audio different or anything like that. We're just, we're in the middle of it, so you don't, you know, you can't see the whole picture. What's up? Sure. Um, let me just, let me just end it though. So no, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, to the grizzled brat bets, like, don't give up hope. To the fresh faced youngins, buckle up. Get ready for a wild ride. I don't know, maybe. Um, but I, you know, I really think that it's going to happen in our lifetime. Okay. Questions. Two questions. I'm going to save the second one. Okay. Um, first question is: Do you think that there's been more innovation in visual animation, etc., because there was a need for more? I mean, audio is pretty good, right? As far as just straight up quality. Yeah. The second As far as audio quality, right? We, yeah. we listen to audio. Audio can be really good, high quality, high fidelity, and it has been yeah. for quite some time. Whereas video in 
form of any video, to be honest, but especially in animation and things like that, people video still has a ways to go before it becomes remotely realistic. Do you think that's part of the reason why there's been more animation? I mean, you, uh, okay, just about the has some way to go. I mean, you realize like most scenes these days in any Hollywood movies where there's a street, there's only one car going down it and the rest are computer graphics. You probably don't even realize how much gra computer graphics there are. But um, anyway, like, sure, absolutely. I mean, one of my favorite, I usually hate footsteps, but in, in Soma, um, the, the footstep li like sample library is larger than the, the visual assets. He's like, every single footstep was recorded in the space that corresponded to it in the game. There's no like, there's no DSP added and, and uh, you know, like it's the purest form of just like complete source microphone, clean location, low background noise, like, and it's beautiful. Like that's some of the stuff Andy did with the witness in a similar way. Like it's beautiful. Um, and, and, but also like there's so many games made with sprites that are gorgeous too. You know, like Final Fantasy, um, I want to say three, but Feel like I should say the Japanese number, which I think is six. Uh, it's gorgeous. All sprites, all handmade, hand animated. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I mean, it's just different. There's different aesthetics that go with each one. There's also different costs as well, too. You know, I mean, I think you can. Uh, there's someone in this room who spent a large portion of last year doing impact sounds for boxes. Um, you know, yeah, and. <laughs> and like, if you have some generative stuff, I mean, you didn't have to like create every single one of those bespoke. Why are we making bespoke impacts for boxes? It's just, I mean, for an artistic game like Soma or Witness or something like that, fuck yeah, man. <laughs> but like for Halo, you can add some like pitch variation at least, <laughs> you know, whatever. So does that, is that satisfactory or do you still not buy it? I still think visually, like just the quality of visuals has come on so far, but it still has so much further to go. Yeah. Like the quality of, of audio, I mean, we've had surround sound audio since before most of us were working in audio. Sure. You know, we yeah. had, okay, so now we put a couple speakers up above you, and now we've got techniques that can theoretically bring some of that into headphones. Okay, so we, we've had those types of innovations, but as far as Quality. Yeah, I'm not including that as in, yeah, in that. There, but, but okay, just quickly so we can get to other questions as well right. too. But um, I mean, I would say like, yeah, there's always, there's going to be a step backwards uh, because, but I mean, you you have like some Dutch uh, painter making photorealistic light bouncing off of there, and then you go to like the first generation of 3D graphics, the Unreal image I showed before. You know, like yeah, there's going to be a step backwards. Right, and we're still like graphics. They're still, you know, trying to reach some of the heights that before. It's true, but um, you know, like you have progress. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you're in a local maxima, or you like there's just, there's just new techniques, right? And it's just going to open up future possibilities. In the, you know, did you have a question? Me? I thought you raised your hand. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's like the general, so when I think of matching like an audio to visual, I think of like the Mac, Mac in general. So yeah. you said there's, so there's stuff when you didn't go to the other one, you could test a visual thing and you could model it and put animation with it. Without bringing the game, you can't do that with sound. What's the next step to like what can you do with that in the second? Yeah, well that's that's what I'm working on and I want to I don't want to be like an advertisement thing but like you can come to the other talk and see oh, what it's oh, all okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, okay, you have a third talk. I'll go to your talk. Um, yeah, I mean I I think yeah, the I that's and I did that just because I got frustrated with the games industry. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. The second question was so you took a magazine as like back in the day you would like the graphic store. And yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. I think that is like when my kids ask like the logical progression of like that because it's like people are still people love audio and there's definitely tons of like game audio and like you know frenetics and all this and that but like then older games those games are still like like there's more media than there is like auditory to them it's so like so for me like I'm trying to get Instagram and sound designer and those are just really hard for your 20 second video on Instagram that like catches people's eye yeah. it's just my dog but you like playing guitar it's such a cool effect to like give to them right? sure yeah okay i mean like that. i mean that's that's exactly um what I was ta- why I said that YouTube streaming or Twitch TV streaming and stuff like that would be the avenue to kind of to do start playing around with this stuff because that's where people do have the audio on and are playing it and it's like i think um I don't know, I think a common theme in a lot of this stuff is like um, people are kind of attached to an older way of doing things and I think it, that the Instagram way is kind of like, uh, it's a modern tweak on a, on, a, on a traditional advertising way, right? Yeah. It's like doing traditional advertising but through a new medium, but like now people don't, aren't glued to the TV, they're, you know, they glued to their phone which they probably have the sound off and stuff like that. So I mean, yeah, it's an issue. Um, but yeah, so, but that's why I think YouTube streamers, or I should just stop, just say streamers, are probably the best avenue to kind of like get that, um, kind of like get people excited about it because that's probably the only place where people do have, consistently have the sound on. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and like I said, like, like I said, like one out of five, to, one to two out of five care about the sound, you know, three to four just care about the visuals and don't care about sound, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, and now I know you're an audio guy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So this may be like stepping on your toes in the next talk and this is what to expect. Uh, so what you're eyeing with this procedural audio stuff is are you more like trying to zone in on um, like doing variations like changing the sound or do you have like are you eyeing music like you can work with your Procedurally, do like background music or working more like an ambience thing. Yeah. So okay, um, I'm fine. I'll just do it. Um, I just didn't. It's not that I. It's not that I'm like stepping on the toes. It's that I wanted this to be really conceptual and not because like literally um, what I'm doing is because of this, and and I'm not trying to. I feel like I don't want to make it come across like I'm trying to justify what I'm doing by like this thing because like this is something that I really spent a lot of time thinking about just complaining at GDC every year with audio guys about, you know, um, about like why it hasn't, like why isn't more cool stuff happening. Uh, so like, so what I'm doing is I'm making a programming, I have made a programming language and now I'm making a bunch of tools that use it. And so like what, what we're about to release right now is what we're calling sound shaders. Um, and they're basically like integrations of this programming language across um, you know, Wise, Unreal, Stock Engine, uh, Audio Engine, uh, Unity Audio. Uh, we're not doing FMOD right now, but we'll do FMOD sooner. DST plugins, right? So, like, it's a programming language where you can write DSP, and um, right now it's just a text language, but it's all it could also be represented visually. So, like, in the future, we'll have the kind of more user friendly one. This is like what we have now is just for early adopters and like highly technical people, but like. In the future, it'll be like a Mac, Max MSP or Reactor style, like drag it, you know, like familiar routing kind of thing. And it's not like calling out to another piece of C code. It is the actual code that's being compiled. So like, um, like you're manipulating the actual syntax tree. So, um, so yeah, so our sound shaders are basically, they're just basically integrations with everything. Right? It's, it's a compiled language, can run anywhere C can run. That means all the plugin architectures can have an integration, right? So what, what that kind of like starts making possible is like instead of you having your runtime effects only in the actual end game engine itself so like with that you have to like 
make a sound in your DAW, you have to export it into WISE, then you have to like build that and then like run it and then like maybe it doesn't catch that one time, so you have to restart the engine, you know, like that happens. Um, and then then you can hear what the actual like low pass filter based on distance sounds like. And in WISE it's pretty resonant. Uh, and so like <laughs> So like you might have to go back to your DAW and change the frequency there and then go through the whole process again. So if you have the, these kind of sound shaders, they're just meant to solve that uh, kind of problem right now, which is like, they're, we haven't built up, because like I said, we want to build up a community of people who are kind of like putting stuff out. There's not that yet. It's like right now, most of my experiments have been with like uh, doing like nest sounds and stuff like that, you know, like really basic waveforms and just like comb filters and things like that. Um, I'll go over some of that in the talk, but like, um, but now you get to hear what it's going to sound like in the game in your DAW without having to go through all of that. That's the short answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. But um, yeah, so I think that's, I, I do think it's important to have a common language. And like I said, like, um, you know, it, it could be the Betamax in this way, but I think that it, if it is something that starts being used, I think it, you know, it's going to start something. Um, hopefully, you know, whatever gets in the middle of it. Yes? Could, it, could you end up, could you like, could the new code language also be used more directly for like virtual reality as well? Like, yeah. I know, I know a lot of places right now still use WY. Audio yeah, 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 yeah. For, for that stuff. yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So for right now, like we're not trying to, I'm not trying to be that ambitious about it. Like, so like right now, you'd use it inside of Wise. So like, yeah. this is not something that replaces any of your tools. Like, gotcha. it's something that works with all of your tools. Yeah. Um, and so like, like for example, there's um, you know, in, in multiplayer games, you have a big problem with mixing when you have all these different types of guns and different frequency content. And so like you just want to throw a multi-band compressor on there, right? Which is pretty common for music. And so and like have maybe some of the parameters controlled by in-game stuff. There's not really an easy way to do that right now. But there will be. <laughs> Whatever. But yeah, so like when it when it comes to VR and like the spatialization, there's or as far as spatialization goes, like some of the improvements over the last like four or five years have been um, pretty stellar. Um, you know, maybe not everyone agrees with me, but um, but I think we've reached a really good level with that in, in VR. This is a whole other conversation. Um, but the, I, I don't want to like be repeating any of that work. I'm not going to be repeating any of that work. We're going to like, you can keep your source generation in wise and use their existing stuff like that, yeah. right? So like it plays nice with other things that do those things. Yeah. Any other questions? I liked the time that you talked about the um, standing on the pile of people. Is that too dark? Troll. Yeah, he's like a troll or something. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome. Though. Yeah. Oh, I said I like a troll. He always looks like a gremlin to me or something. Oh, he's a, he's a troll like and more like it. He's awesome. And uh, he, um, he talks about how he, he built some custom Picasso and then they had a big group of Edison and they kind of stopped and talking about how he used the word seamless instead of seamless to describe his code. That's perfect. And the same thing he said is like, you know, like there's always people, there's always a detection that like for the most part, like the most amount of people who are considered seamless is now or is part of the scene. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Andrew, is there any specific experiences you've had throughout your career that drove you to this state of wanting to really make yeah. sort of an impact like this? And yeah, so, I mean, so, like, I have a background in doing programming kind of, and, like, so basically it's, like, and then, but I'm also a trained musician. And so like, I just got tired of complaining about not having cool toys. <laughs> and like, I think there was, there's, you know, we, it was the middle of the conversation. I remember it's like, I literally said like, someone's got to fix this. And then like afterwards it's like, yeah, there's probably like, a, maybe like 
50 to 100 people worldwide who can actually do it. And then, like, of those, how many actually, like, have the financial incentive to, I mean, you know, like, ability to, like, step away from work for a little while to do it and, like, take the risk on. And so it's like, yeah, it's probably not many people worldwide who could actually do it. Um, and so I was like, I just felt like I had, you know, I felt like it's just something that I had to do, <laughs> basically. Do you, That's you felt. I want to, yeah. Right now, the language is proprietary. I mean, I'm sharing it with some of my friends, but like, yeah, the goal, the goal is that. Um, I mean, time to get into this, but like the visual editor that I talked about that looks like an XMSP, like I wanted that should be like a low subscription fee. But then, like the actual like text language, if you just want to use it without a profile or anything like that, I just want it to be completely free, and I want it to be open source so that people can like contribute to the design of it and stuff like that, and help guide the direction, because like. I didn't mention it, but like one of the things that I found across all these things is that nobody can predict which of those, like, and I said, like, there's a lot of experimentation. Some of the good ideas float to the top. Nobody can predict which, what those good ideas are going to be. You know, you're fighting a losing game if you try and, like, predict what that's going to be. I mean, I mean, you see that cycle happen all the time. Like, VR was, like, a little bit too early, a little bit too much money in it, and like, whatever. Like, at all. So basically, yeah, I really want it to be open source, not just to be like, get it in more people's hands, because that's good too, but like also because I want the community to be driving the overall direction of it, which means like there would be a little loss of control in that way, but like, but if there's a subscription fee for like the easy to use one that has like more profiling, debugging kind of tools, then like, I feel like uh, it could all work out pretty well. <laughs> that's the plan at least. But yeah, that's something that, um, yeah, uh, I, I need to find the right lawyer to talk about that with because it has to be done the right way. That like, this is like one problem with open source. Sorry, I mean, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's it has to be done in a way that the people that you people trust that it's still going to be open source because like people won't want to be involved if they if there's like language in there that's like CYA stuff that's like someday they might take. <laughs> some of that make it proprietary again or fork it into a proprietary thing and and so like it has to be done in a way that like truly is open source like truly is going to be owned by the community so yeah but that's that would be the goal that's the goal yeah thanks for asking <laughs> well there's only a few more minutes here uh, later over beers, maybe. Okay, I'm done. <laughs>